today we're going to have a, a little bit longer session on this video and uh, or, or audio as you're, if you're listening to the podcast. And um, I just pray you'd hang in there. Uh, it may be a little more uh, idea oriented than practical um, practice oriented than the past, but I hope it'll end up in a very practical way. Uh, let's pray to get started. Father in heaven, uh, we pray uh, that you would guide us, guide me as I speak and us as we listen, uh, that we would hear from you, that we would be faithful to respond to you uh, in ways that reflect who you are well and um, carry your image well as we go uh, about our daily lives. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so three weeks so far on LGBTQ issues for Christians in the Hot Topic series. First was on uh, having curiosity and learning and openness rather than judgmentalism. And we're going to exercise that a bit today on the learning. Second was on alternative scriptural interpretations. First of all, the traditional interpretations and then some something about how people who support uh, same-sex marriage uh, would do that based on their interpretation of scripture. And then last time we talked about the approaches of various churches how they are approaching this issue in the life of their church community. Uh, this week, I want to focus a bit on sex and gender, more in the abstract, but also to explain how, how different people view these things. Uh, what are they? How do they relate to LGBTQ plus issues? And uh, we'll, we'll start with some social expectations related to one's sex at birth and more and move on to a more general consideration of sex. And then I'll get into the LGBTQ plus issues. Um, we live in some remarkable times, unique in human history. Now, I grew up in American culture. You know, boys were boys and they wore blue and girls were girls and they wore pink and they wore dresses instead of pants. Susie tells me that she wasn't allowed to wear pants to school until the sixth grade. Uh, I wanna show you a picture. Okay, here's the picture. Who do you think is in that picture? Well, this is, in fact, a picture of the man who served as president of the United States longer than anyone else, elected four times, Franklin Roosevelt. He was taken in 1884 when he was between two and three years old. These days, if you didn't know, you'd say it was a picture of a little girl, right? Well, I learned that it used to be customary to dress young boys in dresses and let their hair grow till sometime between the ages of two and eight. Now, I remember as a kid that my Aunt Doris showed me a picture. Actually, she showed me some old family memorabilia. She showed me a little dress. She says, that was your grandpa's dress when he was a little boy. And I said, what? You mean grandma, don't you? She says, oh no, little boys used to wear dresses. <laughs> Well, I wasn't sure if I could believe her or not, but she assured me it was true. I didn't know what to think, and later I learned it really was all true. I guess expectations changed. I certainly didn't put dresses on my sons when they were little. Um, did you know that in the early 20th century, pink was the color for boys and blue was for girls? You see, pink was from red. Red's a stronger color, so it was for boys. Blue was seen as more delicate, and so it was appropriate for girls. The color associations we have today began in the 1940s, less than 100 years ago, through marketing and retailing when it was decided to promote pink for baby girls and blue for baby boys, and here we are today believing that it matters. Uh, in today's hypersensitive culture, parents fret that having their girls wear blue or boys wear pink might might warp their personality, might make them gay or transgender. Uh, our culture is extremely sensitized to many things that it associates with gender and sexuality, hypersensitized, you might say. Uh, but things differ in time and between cultures. It's confusing and it's often pretty arbitrary. People these days fear giving their children the wrong toys or the wrong colors. They don't buy dolls for boys, well, unless they're G.I. Joe or superhero dolls. <laughs> They don't buy trucks for girls or footballs, do they? The truth is that expressions of masculinity and femininity change over time and differ by culture. Now, there are some troubling examples. 
Uh, most adult women in our culture might use the word tomboy to describe how they enjoyed activities as a girl that our culture associates with being a boy. We don't think too much about that. It's not really surprising to North Americans. We don't attribute anything negative to a woman who talks about being a tomboy when she was younger. However, what if a man describes himself enjoying activities generally associated with girls when they were younger, playing with dolls? Is this considered a positive or negative thing for the man? How might his male friends respond? Well, things associated with maleness and femaleness in our culture carry over into adult life and can be great sources of confusion or conflict. Uh, Rachel Held Evans, uh, I, I read, said about a church that she attended for a time, quote, I left the church because I'm better at planning Bible studies than baby showers, but they only wanted me to plan baby showers. Okay. Well, think of professions that are often associated with women and what it means if a man aspires to that profession, like nurse or kindergarten teacher. Think of professions that are often associated with men and what it means if a woman aspires to that profession, like a Navy SEAL or CEO or pastor of a church. Well, cultural patterns are becoming more flexible these days for professions, but there remain expectations that are associated with male or female types, some might say stereotypes. And, And here's one that gave me some real indigestion, okay? A worth association exercise was was given to a group of students. They were presented with a long list of adjectives, including those from Galatians 5, 22 and 23, for the fruits of the Spirit, where Paul writes, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And the students were asked to rate these qualities as masculine or feminine. Guess what? The fruits of the Spirit were feminine, particularly patient and gentle. However, wouldn't Christians believe that the fruit of the Spirit is gender neutral? I mean, these are human qualities that come through our communion fellowship with the Spirit of God. They're God qualities. So how did these qualities come to be perceived as feminine in American culture? There's, there is much of what is built in to our thinking and expectations that is really kind of arbitrary and limiting. Things are changing and options are opening up for careers and ways of life that used to be restricted by our thinking on gender roles it can be confusing. Like I was confused when I learned my grandfather used to wear a dress. Okay, That's just masculinity and femininity. Arbitrary expectations regarding the roles and behavior of men and women have changed. And oppressive features of fallen human society have been called out and in some cases reduced. Now, I've spoken about this in previous messages in the series. Now, expressions of masculinity and femininity are not the only things that may change. Let's consider sex. Sex as a category, and marriage. Sex has, for most of human history, been practically inseparable from the idea of procreation, having babies. It was almost considered one idea, except for the existence of the human desire for sex without a corresponding desire for a baby to be the result sometimes. In the middle of the 20th century, medical science developed birth control methods that were highly effective. Suddenly, sex could be reliably separated from having babies. It would be extremely difficult to overstate the significance of this event and its implications for the development of human society since. Of course, this created a situation that Christians needed to respond to. The Catholics, the Roman Catholic sphere of Christianity, it was deemed against the natural order of things as created by God to use artificial birth control. Catholics, in my experience, either listen to this teaching and have many children, or attempt to schedule sex to avoid when the wife is fertile, or simply ignore this particular teaching of their church. Protestant teaching was hugely influenced, or maybe it was summarized, I don't really know, by a pronouncement in 1930 by the head of the Church of England in the 1930 Lambeth Conference, where the the, this this man argued that marriage is primarily given for companionship and secondarily for procreation. Thus, birth control could enhance the sexual pleasure that God intends to strengthen the companionship of the wife and the husband. Bottom line, in the Church of England, birth control was counted as permissible. Now, this approach was very influential and basically swept the Protestant world. And frankly, I agree with this argument. The number of children 
given birth by couples fell from over five to just over two. Many benefits came from this change, but I don't, I'm not going to get into that now. Instead, I want to focus on this idea of unhooking sex from having babies. Marriage was reframed then around romantic self-realization of individuals. Now, I'm greatly oversimplifying and leaving out a lot. I highly recommend talks by Sarah Williams, a Christian historian, for deeper insight. I've got some links in the, the, the message notes. But consider the depth of this change. Human society has been framed by relations, relationships in family and community for millennia. Many of us at Long Beach Friends Church are familiar with Khmer culture and language, where given names are rarely used to address other people. Instead, people are addressed according to their relationship to the speaker. Respective age matters, older brother, younger sister, older aunt, younger uncle, and so on through all relationships. And we see that habit in marriages in American culture. How much do you hear married couples using their spouse's name when addressing them? Sometimes I hear, I admit, that's a new thing uh, uh, to hear the names used. But I never heard my parents refer to one another by name. It was hun or your mother or your father, depending on who they're talking to. It carried over partially to other relatives like Uncle Joe, Aunt Doris, Uncle Bill, where relationship and name were combined. It still happens, although I hear babe a lot from younger couples these days. The new thing that happens is that some refer to family members by given names for those that are not closely related. Given names are used more than titles signifying relationship. And outside the family, it's pretty much always that way. It's not bad, of course. Some humans in the past were coerced into referring to other humans as master or sir or your lordship. Those customs have largely fallen away, though they're not quite gone. The point is, this is a historically significant shift from marriage and the way we think about family and relationships as, as a covenant relationship within an extended community for having and raising children toward a more romantic self-realization or self-actualization. Authenticity towards oneself became the standard in the mid-20th century. Today, we're so accustomed to this shift that we tend to hear about it and just shrug it off. So what? Uh, it sounds pretty good to us. And it's true that this emphasis makes it easier to overcome certain oppressive excesses of the past. However, have we exchanged past evils for new excesses and pressures? Some believe we have, and some embrace what we, what, what we have now as better times. Let's put it in positive terms. It is a way of unlocking men and women from the arbitrary stereotypes that limited the life options open to a man or a woman. Well, what does that have to do with LBGTQ issues? Well, this prioritization on authenticity to oneself opened up the possibility that if one's sex or gender is merely a social construct, more on that later, then logically there's no reason why the gender or sex that one chooses should correspond to our physical bodies. Now I come to these questions, these issues, and beliefs as a Christian. What's a Christian to think, to teach, to pass on as values? I want to recognize the inherent dignity of every human being, created in the image of God and loved by him, working out in each life the gifts and talents that God gives. This is where the very evil practice of some groups yelling things like God hates and, well, you fill in the blank, uh, goes so very, very far astray. There's really nothing about us as God followers that isn't changed when we follow Jesus. I have mentioned this many times, Paul in Romans 12, 1 and 2, this time in IV translation. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Well, so first, after we realize who God is, we give him everything we are and everything we do. 
At least that's the ideal. It's what we work towards. That includes sexuality, gender identity, beliefs, stereotypes, expectations, everything. This is the truest and best response to God by humans whom he created. We owe him literally everything. Whatever we should think about sexuality and gender, gender identity, it starts with him. This is in contrast to our culture, the pattern of the world. Now, as God's people, we listen to him, we engage his wisdom. And the contrast is vivid all through scripture. Do we listen to God and trust him to guide us? Or do we say, joining with many others throughout history, well, it looks good to me. Back to our focus on gender and sex. Genesis 1.27 So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Well, I think this must mean that male and female are real things from God, inherent in his creation somehow, and not simply human conventions. Of course, we live in a fallen creation. It's not in the ideal state that it was when God first created it. And there may well be an impact on male and female biology, as we'll see. Um, People argue over exactly what constitutes essential maleness and femaleness and confuse this with cultural patterns invented by humans and circumstances and things that came from the fall even. But there is something real in, in, in God creating humans, male and female. Let's consider sex and gender, see how they relate to LGBTQ plus issues. Now, let me say from the outset, I have no expert on all this. I'm someone trying to learn and understand and then represent Jesus well in my relationships and teaching as a pastor. So I'm equipped to love others. That's what, where, I, where I want to go, right? One author and clinical psychologist who's a Christian specializes in sexual and gender identity. His name is Mark Yarhouse. You'll be able to detect in my... Uh, thoughts and words, my dependence upon him as a resource. I'll give some links to him and to some of his resources in the message notes. Okay, more on some basic conceptual categories that I referred to already to help us understand LGBTQ+. In the 20th century, the psychiatric community, medical community, began to distinguish the concepts of biological sex, gender identity, and sexuality. This was, of course, influenced greatly by the unhooking of sex from having babies. Okay, Biological sex or sex of the body, that means what's embodied in, in, uh, in your inherited traits, right? In your DNA, in your hormones, in your physical characteristics. That's what people mean by biological sex. Well, what is gender identity? Gender identity is the internal sense of masculinity or femininity and the social roles associated with those feelings about yourself. What's sexuality? Well, that's distinct from biological sex and gender identity. It's about desire. Who are you attracted to? And then related behaviors to that. That's your sexuality. Now, when I was a kid and I filled out forms for school, there was often a blank for sex, all right? I recall the younger kids would often ask, how how do we answer that question? What is that about? Of course, it was expected that one would enter male or female. Sometimes school kids would write boy or girl when other kids laughed at them. Uh, The joke for adolescent adolescent boys, of course, was to answer for sex, yes. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Nowadays, the blank is not labeled sex. It's labeled gender, and the accepted responses are a lot more complicated. But this change is far from the most consequential change now that sex gender, and sexuality have come to be differentiated. Even these concepts of sex and gender are seen as objectionable by some. They come to us primarily from the medical field, and some critics see things more politically or through other lenses. Example, Susan Stryker, a lesbian transgender woman, author of the book Transgender History, writes, quote, how a society organizes its members into categories based on their unchosen physical differences has never been a politically neutral act. Well, she has a point, which I think pretty much any woman or person of color would see. Okay, but I'll not delve further into the criticisms here. I'll just say that the oppressions of the past 
have repercussions in the present as the power of oppressive systems are broken. Reactionary results in this fallen world are often still broken, but in a different way. How do we live up? How do we live the life of Jesus in these times? It seems not so easy. The thing to grasp is that many no longer see a necessary relationship between the biology of the body and the gender category that a person takes on. Some parents who take this perspective to an extreme refuse to categorize their children as male or female. They see themselves as, quote, dismantling the sex gender system. Well, from these foundational concepts, beginning with unhooking, having babies from sex, let's go on and try to understand the categories that are associated with that LGBTQ plus acronym. Now, before I get into that, you might ask, is this a suitable topic for a pastor to speak on in a message? Well, my motivation is to love those who have so often been hated or scorned, particularly by Christians. Listening and understanding is an act of love, okay? So I'm going to jump in. What do all those letters in LGBTQ plus mean anyway? L stands for lesbian, identifies a non-male who's sexually attracted to females. Gay describes people who experience sexual attraction to people of the same gender. Bisexual, B, describes those who are attracted to people of more than one gender. T, transgender, is a broad term for experiences of gender identity that do not align as expected with a person's biological sex. I'll have more to say about that in a minute. Now, this is not one of the part of the acronym, but there is another word that's related that you may have heard, cisgender, C-I-S, gender. It's used to describe those for whom gender identity and birth sex are the same. Why cis? Because in Latin, cis means on this side, trans means on the other side or beyond. Q stands for one of a couple of things. One might be questioning, describe, describing those who are questioning some aspect of their sexuality or gender. And the other use of Q is for queer, which is a broad term that describes people who are not exclusively heterosexual. And then the plus sign, what's that about? Well, that means there's more, much more, like A and I and 2S. And I'll give a link so you can explore the terminology further. The I, though, that's intersex. It's often used, listed at the end, sometimes not. Some people are born with ambiguous genitalia. That's what the term intersex is about. There are genetic conditions that result in this symptom. One has not just XX or XY chromosomes, but other combinations. There are embryonic conditions that can result in ambiguous genitalia, even when the DNA is normal. I tend to see these as symptoms of the fallen nature. Others do not. And there are cases where the cause of ambiguity is not able to be determined. To make this more complicated, there's no clear consensus definition of intersex. Commonly, uh, it's used to refer to those with disorders of sex development, also known as DSD. Well, as God's people, we just have to empathize with those for whom male and female are not so clear and show compassion, even if we believe male and female are more than social constructs. Now, how common is this condition? Well, that's another question without a clear answer. Some people do not agree on exactly what the condition is, so there's no agreement on how common it is. The highest estimate seems to be around 1.7%. I'd take that as an upper limit of, of, of humans. Other estimates are smaller. Apparently only about one in 2,000 babies is born with ambiguous genitals. But this is not the only condition labeled as intersex. Well, what if there are more intersex-like conditions that are not physically obvious even, that remain unknown and manifest in non-physical ways. Well, 
I can't get into that. I don't know anything more about that. Let's turn our focus now to broader transgender issues. I focused in the past a lot on the whole same-sex marriage issue. Well, trans issues are another dimension of the LGBTQ plus world that many Christians find confusing. Transgender is not about who you're attracted to. It's about having a gender identity that does not match the society's expectations based, that are based on your physical characteristics. For example, a male who dresses as a female, that's trans. Whether the person desires to physically become a female or not. Some trans people do desire to become the other gender or another gender. If a woman transitions to become a man, they're called a, quote, transgender man. I mentioned a lesbian transgender woman before. That particular woman was born as a man, converted to live as a woman, and is attracted to women. This is where gender-affirming care enters the picture. Rates of transgender self-identification these days are much higher among youth than among adults, and the rate seems to be growing. Why? No one really knows, as far as I can tell. Some claim it's due to increased self-awareness now that it's safe to be honest. Others claim it is social contagion. It's popular these days because of TV and social media, fashionable, the power of suggestion, and so on. Well, as you can imagine from the nature of those contrasting exp explanations, disagreement quickly becomes very heated. Scientifically speaking, I don't think we really know what's going on. No theory that I've heard adequately explains what we encounter as a society. We have people whose behavior does not conform to expected norms for their sex in varying degrees. We have emerging gender identities. We have searching teenagers who are impacted by some sometimes traumatic changes that come with puberty. We have much greater incidence of something called gender dysphoria than in the past, it seems. What is gender dysphoria? Well, that's the distress that someone feels deeply if their gender identity does not match up with their biological sex. That is, perhaps you were born biological male, but feel like you're a female, or vice versa, and this causes serious anxiety or stress. Feelings of gender dysphoria can be very intense and often lead to suicidal impulses. Uh, and it, gender dysphoria can be early onset in childhood, or it can happen later, People in their 60s sometimes have gender dysphoria suddenly. It's a real thing. It's probably been around for a long time. Various societies have classified it as sin, as sickness, as crime, or in some societies, even a gift from whatever gods they believe in. Western society these days has shifted from viewing it in terms of a mental health problem or a moral problem to something more acceptable, often treated with gender-affirming techniques. These techniques include that gender-affirming care that I mentioned, drugs, hormone treatment, surgery, that a number of states are outlawing for minors. What we as Christians need to recognize is that gender dysphoria is a very real experience for an increasing number of young people. There may be social or psychological or physiological or spiritual causes. Uh, and, you know, it's not the same thing, but I'm reminded of young ladies I've known who identified as lesbian for a time because of, it seemed obvious to me, very bad experiences with young heterosexual men. What was helpful was to listen to them, try to understand, and love them. Later, most of them embraced heterosexual relationships and marriage. Of course, most of those young ladies did not have gender dysphoria. But their life experiences were real, their feelings were real, and that's my point. Something real is going on with gender dysphoria, and we need to listen, we need to learn, and we need to love. All this is complicated by intersex biological conditions. Some laws regarding gender-affirming care include exemptions for intersex conditions, and some do not. It's confusing situations with politicians trying to score points with their supporters by outlawing medical treatments that they may not understand. This seems counterproductive. Many argue even that intersex treatment from the LGBTQ community uh, that's usually done with parent, parental consent 
for infants and children should not be performed until the treated person is able to understand and choose the type of gender affirming care they want. Well, how many of those who receive gender affirming care later regret it? Well, one study considered 1,989 trans patients who underwent gender affirming surgery between 2016 and 2021. Six of those 1,989 requested a reversal. That's 0.3%. On the other hand, not much time has passed. A 2022 study in the Netherlands found that 98% of trans youth continued their treatments into adulthood. For perspective, a study of knee replacement surgery reported 18% of those in the study were unhappy with their knee replacement, a much higher rate. One two-year study of 315 younger recipients of gender-affirming care showed that most had, quote, positive life satisfaction and decreased depression and anxiety symptoms. However, 11 had suicidal ideation and two died by suicide. While those statistics are used by those who argue for and against the laws that prohibit gender-affirming care for minors. The expressed concern of those supporting the laws is that parents and doctors are using this kind of therapy on growing numbers of children and young people too quickly and without enough caution. My conclusion, we have a lot to learn in this area. Politicizing it is not helpful. Those on both sides of gender issues still differ on some fundamental questions. Is gender binary? That is, either male or female. Can it change? Some believe that gender is entirely a social construct. That is, no person is absolutely gendered and it can get uh, more unusual. One social media platform defines literally dozens of genders. Gender queer as a term and non-binary is another term that one finds in those discussions. Well, a practical controversy that comes out of gender issues is the use of pronouns. Okay, you all know about he, his, and she, her, and you've probably heard that some people prefer gender neutral pronouns like they, them, and that others want to be referred to with pronouns that don't fit their biological sex. Some find they and them clumsy because they're commonly plural and want to be referred to with a gender neutral set of singular pronouns that you may not have known, heard of. Z, zer, Z, E, Z, I, R. People, particularly teachers, can be fired for not using the preferred pronouns of students or whomever. In other situations, it's considered bad form to use the wrong pronouns for someone. And in other situations, one's expected to never use pronouns non-traditionally. There's not a lot of tolerance. Stories to generate outrage about this are common clickbait online. We, the people of Jesus, God's people, we have an opportunity here when things are so negative and hate-filled. We can demonstrate a better way or at least show our best efforts towards a better way. We can turn to God and ask him to guide us, to show us how to love in the truth and to be humble. As Jesus says, as he teaches, right? Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. These are profoundly simple instructions. Of course, the devil is in the details, so to speak. We really need God's help. Remember, paraphrasing 1 John 4, 4, and this is a really big thing for us. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. We don't need to be afraid. We do need to be humble. We need to be alive as branches attached to the vine that is Jesus and let God prune away at us and make us more fruitful. May Jesus be present in us and through us. I'm going to close with prayer. Father in heaven, we pray that on these contentious topics where people are so easily hurt and so easily angered, uh, you would give us your wisdom and your love. Enable us to be truthful people, loving people who represent you well, um, who are not condemning people, judgmental people, but also people who really trust you to guide us into the best ways of life that you've created us for. Lord, there's so many things about this that we don't 
really know uh, enough to, to grasp for ourselves. We need you to guide us. We need your heart. And we desire to, to love other people the way you do. So Lord, guide us in that. And we pray these things in Jesus' name.